jump right into it. So um, hopefully some of you know what a community choice aggregation program is. Show of hands, maybe? Okay, great. I don't have to explain that. I think you've got that covered. Um, so a little bit about who we are in San Jose. So we operate a community choice aggregation program. And then we also recently formed a municipal utility. So I'll talk a little bit about the CCA. We've been operating that since 2017. Um, it was when we launched it. And then we first started serving customers back in 2019. So now our revenues um, are, are about uh, 500 million a year now. Our annual load is about four terawatt hours. With a peak demand in the summer of about a gigawatt. Um, in terms of customer accounts, we serve the entire city of San Jose unless they've opted out. And we have a very high rate, about 97% of customers have chosen to stay with us. Um, in terms of our customer makeup, about 21% are low income. And so that's something that we focus a lot on in San Jose, especially when we think about the programs that we're developing for our customers. And then, you know, something we're really proud of is we have um, quite a few rooftop solar customers, so about 34,000 rooftop solar customers in San Jose now, and we're really trying to grow that over time. Um, most of our customers are in a product that we call Green Source, which um, is 60% renewable and 24% carbon-free. And so that carbon-free comes from a combination of hydro and then a allocation from pg e that we get on their nuclear facility. And then the rest is unspecified. So I'll just skim over this really quickly, just for those that aren't familiar with the CCA. But what a CCA allows is for cities and, and counties and other local government agencies to go ahead and procure that energy. So that's the source. And typically, um, here in the Bay Area, most CCAs are very focused on renewable energy sources. Um, that energy flows through the California grid, through the California ISO, the transmission system. And then it's a partnership with a local investor and utility here in Northern California, PG&E, who distributes that energy over the distribution lines to the end customer. So that, that's how it works. A little bit about the CCA movement, really proud today that there's over 25 CCAs now, which is really exciting. We serve 14 million customers in California. So over 200 cities and counties you can see on this map, everything in the green is where CCA is currently operating. Um, the yellow is where they filed an implementation plan with the Public Utilities Commission, and so they will be serving those soon. And then the blue is where they're exploring a CCA. So it's just been a huge growth across California. As I said, we started in May of 2017 and uh, started serving customers in 2019, but the first CCA MCE started serving customers back in 2010, so almost 15 years of operation, really success, a successful model there. So a little bit about Climate Smart San Jose. One of the reasons our community decided to form the CCA is really to advance our Climate Smart goals. And so the city of San Jose has a plan called Smart, Smart San Jose. Um, which really aligns with the International Paris Agreement to reduce carbon. And something we're really proud of is back in 2021, our council set a really ambitious goal for our community to reduce community-wide carbon to be carbon neutral by 2030. So we're five years away from that. Um, and we've taken some really bold steps to get there. Also really important in the plan is promoting equity and increasing affordability for our customers, as well as supporting our communities of concern. So a little bit about Climate Smart and what it focuses on. The first pillar is to have a sustainable um, smart city. And for that, there's, there's a couple focus areas that we've been very focused on. One is transitioning to renewable energy, and that's where San Jose Clean Energy provides a huge role. That was one of the main reasons the city wanted to go forward is so that we could have more local control over our generation and really make that transition faster. Um, the other strategy under that is to really embrace our California climate. Um, and so make sure that we're working on climate and, and water strategies that really align with that. And the second pillar is a vibrant city, uh, you know, connected, focused on connected and focused growth. So one thing we're very aware of in San Jose is that we're growing rapidly. So our general plan, um, just to put it in context, by 2040, 
they think we'll have so much growth that the city of Oakland um, will be added to San Jose. So a huge amount of growth over the next few decades. And so we know it's really important as we plan for that growth that we do that in a smart way that doesn't increase our carbon emissions. So one thing we're very focused on is densifying our city so that we can accommodate all this growth. So more multifamily housing, things like that, more transit located near that so that we can reduce those carbon emissions. Um, another key focus area there is really making our homes more efficient and affordable for our families, you know, both the existing stock and all of this growth that, that's happening. And then the third is really focusing on clean, um, personalized mobility choices. So whether that's electric vehicles or electric scooters, e-bikes, more access to public transportation, we're, we're focused on a lot of that. And then number four is really focusing on that public transportation infrastructure and making sure that's accessible to our community too, so that we don't end up like a mini LA, which many people can go to San Jose now and, and really increasing all those cars um, in our city. And then third pillar is an economically exclusive of opportunity. So one thing that's very unique about San Jose that um, isn't typical in most large cities is that more people are traveling out of our city to go to jobs elsewhere that are coming into the city during the day. So a lot of people live in San Jose and then they travel outward to go to these jobs. And so we know that's a huge source of carbon emissions. So we are really trying to grow local jobs in our community to really reduce those vehicle miles traveled. Um, also really focused on uh, commercial goods movement. So we operate an airport. There's a lot of delivery trucks in our area and just really making sure that those uh, companies are transitioning their fleets to electric vehicles as well. And then finally focused on improving our commercial building stock. Um, this has been a huge focus for our, our downtown, especially after the pandemic to, you know, really help those, those buildings electrify and make energy efficiency improvements to reduce those carbon emissions. So with all that, you might think, well, where are we today? Well, this graph shows you where our emissions are coming from today. So more than half coming from transportation, um, which is no surprise. So that's why um, really at San Jose Clean Energy and across the city, we're very focused on how can we re reduce those emissions. And then the second largest category is um, natural gas usage. So really focus on helping people electrify, get off that natural gas in the, uh, you know, in the building stock primarily. And then finally, um, you see electricity, so that's 12.7%. And so that's where San Jose Clean Energy is really important to, you know, fully transition to renewable energy by 2030. So those, I would say, are the three areas we're super focused on. You can see power source, transmission, buildings. Um, but a little bit about the grid of the future. So another thing that we're really focused on in San Jose, you know, I talked a lot about how much growth we're going to have. Um, you know, this is a study that came out from the California Energy Commission that electric consumption is expected to rise about 30% across California. And in San Jose, we're seeing huge um, increases, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. But we know to accommodate that, the grid infrastructure really needs to be upgraded. Um, so we're working on that. Um, you know, one study came out that about 100 billion is needed in new transmission and distribution statewide if our peak load doubles. And so that's a really big number. And we've been thinking a lot about that. If, you know, one, it's it's you know, very slow as far as to build this new transmission. It's going to be very expensive. So we're thinking about what can we do to reduce some of that transmission. We know we're going to need a lot of it. So we are um, advocating that a lot of transmission gets built. But how can we also look at distributed energy resources to reduce some of those costs and those infrastructure costs? So a lot of thought going into that. So in terms of our um, long-term renewable resources, you know, since we began, we've been pretty aggressive in contracting for um, renewable resources. So in the portfolio today, we have about 500 30 megawatts of solar that's located in Fresno, Merced, and um, Kern County. We also have part of a large wind project in New Mexico that you may have heard of. It's one of the largest wind projects in the United States. Um, and then we have a little bit in geothermal and then two, sorry, 370 megawatts of battery storage. And we're really just getting started. Um, so we're actively adding to this portfolio 
we know um, we're probably going to need to double these numbers as we make sure that our, our entire portfolio is um, renewable to hit that 2030 goal, but also to hit all this future low growth. So this is a graph that comes from our integrated resource plan about how we're um, transitioning to that renewable future and, and what that bill looks like through 2035. So it's a tremendous amount of resources that we need to bring online. So a little bit about opportunities within that. So um, you know, one thing that's really exciting right now is that renewables are pretty cost competitive um, with fossil fuels. So there is an opportunity, uh, you know, we think to reduce costs for customers. And a couple of things that we're really focused on in, in terms of affordability is one, taking advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act, and we hope that stays intact. <laughs> um, a couple of things um, along that way that we've taken some steps there is um, opportunities to build our own assets, right? And so in the Inflation Reduction Act, there are provisions in there that allow public agencies to take advantage of the tax credits by building their own assets. And so um, we formed an entity called, Cal well, we and, and many other CCAs formed an entity called California Community Power which allows CCAs to jointly procure together. And, and that's really important for not only opportunities with the Inflation Reduction Act, but also to look at some of these emerging technologies and to reduce our collective risks. So when we think about um, you know, advanced batteries, when we think about compressed air storage, hydrogen, offshore wind, things like that, you know, California Community Power can be very helpful to all of us where you know, we could take a smaller slice of a product along with other CCAs and still, you know, see those emerging technologies develop and, and become cost competitive. Okay. So some of the challenges, I, I talked about some of this, but obviously we have a huge need for additional transmission um, to bring these projects online. And so that's something we are advocating around, but also looking at everything that we can do to, um, you know, reduce that transmission build out. You know, what can we do with the virtual power plants locally with demand side resources so that, um, you know, we're also keeping rates affordable and cost competitive. Um, we know that the energy bills are really going up here in California and that's really important to our customers. So more and more that that's one of our huge focuses. Um, additionally, some of our projects have been delayed, particularly some of the transmission is getting delayed. Um, number of issues there, supply chain issues, inflation, things like that. Some of that's getting better as we get further away from the pandemic, which is great, um, but it's still an enormous challenge to build out the transmission that we're gonna need. And then one of the other challenges is just the load growth, you know, in that evening peak, right? Those are the hours that are gonna be the most expensive to serve, or the most expensive to decarbonize. Um, so we're really looking at programs that can incentivize people to shift that load to different hours, solar on the grid, um, more renewable resources, um, because we know that evening peak and those overnight hours are, are going to become increasingly difficult, especially in the winter um, when there's not enough solar generating. Another thing that we've been, um, you know, struggling with is, you know, not only is California set some ambitious goals in San Jose, but really across the West, um, which is really great that you see a lot of states having similar goals, but it is increasing competition around these raw materials and components. So something we've been focused on with our economic development office and also the state is how can we create uh, some of these local manufacturing ind industries here in the US to diversify some of this. And then of course, the regulatory landscape is always changing. So transmission, transportation, electrification. So as you saw from that graph, that's our largest source of carbon emissions. So it's something we're very focused on. So at San Jose Clean Energy, we've um, invested about $10 million in public chargers. Um, most of these are located in our communities of concern and our um, Working a lot on education and outreach with those neighborhoods. You know, a lot of people still think today when they think of an electric car, they think of a Tesla, they think it's a luxury item that's going to be very expensive. It's not for them. So we spend a lot of time educating customers on, on the full breadth of options now, right? There's some very economic, affordable options out there. Almost every car manufacturer now has an EV, which is really great, but a lot of people don't know that. Um, also working a lot with Caltrain, which I'll talk about in a second. And then partnering with our airport has been really important to you. So we're working with them on their master plan and some exciting things there with the new um, electric uh, 
um, airplane and um, mobility sources there. But also, you know, in their long-term parking lot, one thing we're working on is just putting in level one charging there. You know, not every place needs a DC fast charger or even a level two, right? If you're going on a trip for many days, a, a level one charger is fine, right? And that's going to reduce costs and um, and help people from home and, and make sure that they have a charged vehicle. So as I said, you know, we have a, a suite of programs really focused on um, encouraging people to adopt EVs and not only EVs, but also e-bikes and scooters and other things. But one of the things we hear most consistently from our community when we ask them, well, why why wouldn't you buy an EV? And one is cost. And I think that that's where I talked about before, where there's a lot of assumptions people have about how much electric vehicles cost. And then the other is difficulty charging. So if they can't charge at home, they're hesitant to buy one because they're not sure if they can charge it. So a couple of things that we've been working on is um, some rebates for customers, especially our low-income customers, to bring that cost down, and then also education about the, the types. But one thing I'm really excited about is this DC fast charging um, pilot that we're doing. So we're trying to install DC fast chargers in partnership with our parks and our libraries in our low-income neighborhoods. Is what we're seeing in San Jose is that there's a lot of private, like the Electric by Americas and the EV goes on the west side of the city and not so much on the east side of the city. And so we're really trying to fill that gap with putting in these new DC fast chargers. Um, also working on multifamily EV chargers, um, helping those developers with that. And then of course, increased education. We just did a really successful ride and drive event with my staff was at where we were at the Earthquake Stadium and a um, number of different EVs there so that people could come and take a look at them, get a better feel for them without having all the pressure of being at a dealer and pressure to buy one. So we expect to do a lot more events like that in the future. And then, it, you know, as I said, we're doing a lot of work with San Jose Mineta Airport on their electrification. So not only, you know, making sure that airport and all the buildings can electrify the parking lots, but also some of these new electric aircraft um, really working with them to understand what their power needs are going to be in the future, which are huge. You know, some of these new electric aircraft, they're they're going to land. They need almost a megawatt of power to charge and cool it before they can take off again. And so, um, pretty interesting technology, fascinating. Um, but a lot of work going on there to make sure that, in coordination with PG&E, so that we have enough power to in the future. Um, and of course, Caltrain, um, they're one of our customers. They're also one of the Energy's customers. Um, they average about half a million riders a month, which is great to see some of that coming back. Um, in our service territory, they're, they're on our total green service, which is 100% renewable, which is great for them. Um, you know, now they're quieter, faster, cleaner as they've electrified. So it's a really great option for customers. Um, and those greenhouse gas emissions are about 250,000 tons per year. So that's really great. Um, so really encouraging people to take Caltrain and that option. On to buildings. So in terms of building electrification, we're focused on a couple of things. Really proud that back in 2021, our city council passed a REACH code that prohibits natural gas and new construction. And so that's going to be really important that new development that's coming today. Um, but we're also really focused on the existing building stock. And we have a number of incentives to help those customers electrify and get out that natural gas, which is our second biggest contributor to the So we have a home appliance saving program. This is really focused on our moderate income households. And so they can get 50 to 70% off these appliances. Um, and smart thermostats. And then recently we just added induction cooktops to that as well. So that's been a very successful program for a lot of potential customers to get them off gas appliances. And then for our small businesses and some of our schools, we've had a pretty successful program where they get a 80 to 90% rebuy off of a new HVC refrigeration um, or water heating components to help them electrify as well. So this has been really important small businesses and businesses. And then finally, working a lot with our data centers. Um, you know, there's a huge demand for these data centers all across Silicon Valley and in the region, um, really driven by AI. Um, 
And so we're working with a number of tech companies in, in North San Jose, but just to put some of the figures in context, you know, pg &E has stated in their public filings that they expect about three and a half gigawatts of data centers by 2029. So that's huge, huge amount of load growth in the valley. Um, and about half of that is going to be cited in San Jose. So that's, that's a lot of load that we need to plan for. So actively meeting with a number of these companies to understand what their needs are so that we can make sure that not only on the generation side, we're ready, but also that they can get connected on the distribution side. So one of the things that we did last year, which I'll talk about skip this ahead here, that we did last year is we formed San Jose Power. So our city council formed a new municipal electric utility. So this is separate from San Jose Clean Energy. Um, it will provide not only generation, but distribution service to uh, these customers. And the reason that we did this is, is really demand from these tech companies needing to get connected quickly. Um, and there's an opportunity that's pretty unique in San Jose where there's two new large 500 um, megawatt transmission lines coming into the city. One is coming from the south, from Metcalf substation, if you know where that is. It's in the south part of the city, all the way into downtown. And then there's another one coming in from down through North San Jose and downtown. And so those new transmission lines present an opportunity where we as the city can connect to that, build out distribution infrastructure to serve this new load. So one thing that's very different, um, our focus to what some other cities are doing is we're really focused on new load. We're not trying to take over PG&E's existing infrastructure. Um, we are really looking at where there's redevelopment going on in parts of the city and if we can connect these customers in those areas. We're also looking at connecting our own city load. So one of these transmission lines also goes right past our large wastewater treatment plant, which we already own a, you know, a good amount of distribution infrastructure there. It also goes next to the airport. So we're looking at potentially serving those two loads as well uh, for San Jose Power. Um, it's a really early uh, stage right now. So these transmission lines are not gonna be connected and, and online likely until 2028, maybe 2029. Um, they expect to start construction in 2026. So a lot of the design and engineering work is going on. Um, and so that would be the earliest that we would serve these new customers. With that, I'm, I'm